Amen. Thank you, Kendall, for leading us in that wonderful hymn this evening. God bless you. Hope you've had a, a wonderful day. We come back together from the sanctuary of Crestview Baptist Church to worship together on this beautiful day. I love the snow that came early this morning. It changed to rain. It kind of depresses me. A little boy in me, I love to play in the snow, but maybe some more snow tomorrow, whatever. But God is good to us, and uh, we rejoice in the opportunity together. Uh, thank you for joining me again online on our Facebook feed, maybe our YouTube channel. Uh, I want to get right into the Word of God together tonight before we retire for this wonderful day that God has given. Uh, God blessed us immensely this morning in our worship from the second chapter of Romans. And I want to invite you back to that same portion of God's Word tonight uh, as Romans chapter 2. And I'll read tonight 1 through 5. Uh, Romans chapter 2, 1 through 5. Uh, what a glorious uh, thing God has done for us in bringing us into the, the epistle of Romans in these days. As we're reading through these chapters one by one each and every day, I hope you and your family are in the Word every day with me and uh, together as the family of God. I want to read the first five verses of Romans chapter 2. Here again is the Word of God. Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, who, whoever you judge, in whatever you judge... Another you condemn yourself, for you, were, you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you judge those practicing that such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you, not, do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Herein is the word of God. Let's ask his help tonight as we look at these verses. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. All we've experienced this day, we give you thanks. For the worship you imparted to us this morning, we rejoice that those who could gather and those at home, and now we've gathered online tonight, seeking your word before we retire for the evening. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful, wonderful, powerful, inerrant word of God. Without error is your word. Speak to us, Father. Without you, we can do nothing. I need you. We need you desperately. Help us now as we look. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, the thought that I want to leave you tonight before you retire to bed in a little while is this. You, in the gospel, the gospel is this. You are worse off than you think, and you're more loved than you can imagine. Take that truth home with you. You are worse off than you think, but you're more loved than you ever can imagine. How can we make a statement like that about the gospel? Well, Paul is teaching us that as we know more and more about sin, and more and more about the wrath of God against sin, and the more we become understanding of human nature, of who we are outside of Christ... Then we'll begin to understand the glorious gospel is this. You're worse off than you think, but you're more loved than you could ever imagine. I take an example, of course, from our Lord Jesus. Turn with me to the second chapter of John's gospel, where Jesus was being enthralled with the crowd. The crowds were excited because he was doing miracles before them, and they were coming in multitudes. He did not get excited about their coming, but what he did for them. Listen to what he said in John 2, 23 and follows. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name and they saw the signs that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And he had no need that anyone should testify of men, for he knew what was in man. He knew the nature of of man, of fallen man. If we understand our sinful nature, if we understand the nature that's in humanity, 
in us, in you, and in me. The result will be this. You will fight your sin with more intensity. You'll push back on the sinfulness that which you are and I am. And you will understand you'll be able to bless other people more and more. You'll find yourself being more patient with people, more long-suffering with people, more long-suffering and forbearance as God is to us. The more you understand the sinful nature that we all have, we will become deep lovers of God and deep lovers of people. We see deep lovers of God and deep lovers of people are deep knowers of human nature. That's what the teaching of God's Word is for us tonight. The Apostle Paul gives us the very center and very essence of the good news of Christianity. And the first message of the good news of Christianity is bad news. We're lost. We're sinful. We are worse off than you realized. That's the first point of the gospel. But God does something marvelous and wonderful. God himself acts in history. He actually does. He comes into our time-space capsule. Turn with me to the third chapter of Romans. Romans 3, 24 and 26, our reading for today. Verse 24 says this, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at this present time his righteousness. That he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In those verses are a nutshell, again, a encapsulation of the gospel itself. God acts in history. Jesus comes and, and lives a perfectly righteous life. He died on the cross in our place, you see. Because he did not deserve to die. We deserve to die. But he took our place. And then in the middle of the argument that Paul is bringing in that first chapter again in Romans in 16 and 17, he gives us the heart again of the gospel. Is, that's why he's not ashamed. He said, of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God. It is the power of God on salvation and those who would believe. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, you see. The just shall live by faith. Verse 16, we see, is a statement of the gospel. And verse 17, then, is an explanation of that gospel. Someone wrote this one time, and I, I, it blessed my heart, and I want to share it with you. I don't remember who wrote it, but it really summarizes what God has done for us. That which God requires, God achieves. That which God reveals, God bestows. Isn't that wonderful? That's what God requires. He achieves. He did for us what he requires. And when he reveals the message, that he bestows it. He gives it to us. That's why Christianity is good news. This is the best news, the good news of Christianity. The message is that we all need the gospel. That's why Paul is laboring, laboring hard and heavy in this first sections of Romans. He wants all to know that they are sinners, that we all need the gospel. This long section that we're in in our teaching this day, from 118 to 320, sin, 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 over and over, Jews and Gentiles alike. He wants them and us to know that you are worse off than you ever realized, but you're more loved than you ever can imagine. Both Jews, all the privileges of Jews and the Gentiles and nations. That's why the long section, that nobody's perfect. And deep down we suppress the truth in unrighteousness, Paul says. And that we all are separated from God. And we need His salvation that only God can do. So now we're back to Romans chapter 2. 
He's now speaking to Jews. We talked about that this morning. Uh, Jews, the righteous, the religionists of the day. You could liken this to the members of the church. He now turns in the second chapter. And he wants to get fully in, in our, under our skin. He wants to get fully, get us riled up. He wants us to know how sinful sinners that we are. That's his purpose, he says. And that's why in the first chapter, in the end portion of the first chapter, he is so inclusive about our sins. He says in verse 29 of chapter 1, he says, We're all filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, uh, evil of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, that means gossips, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only those who do the same, but also those who approve and the, their practice thereof. That's the most devastating commentary there is verse 3 2. Maybe you didn't do some of those things, but you sat back and you approved of what they were doing. So it's very powerful, it, it's all inclusive. And now you can almost hear the religion people, religionists, the, the people who go to church on the corner over here. They're, they're saying out of the corner of their mouth, they're kind of saying, Well, yeah, those are bad things, Paul, but I don't murder. I've never committed adultery. I've never lied. I've never, there's certain things other people have done, but, but not me. Paul is zeroing in on hypocrisy, zeroing in on the self-righteous, and he, he turns the tide in chapter 2 of Romans. We need to remember something that brings heaviness to our hearts, but many people who go to Christian churches are not Christians. Many people who go into the church these days are not true believers in Christ. They would be what we'd call hypocrites. I looked the word hypocrites up in my theological books. And this is the definition I got for a hypocrite. One who puts on a mask and plays himself to be what he is not. I I sat back and started laughing. Look, everybody's got masks on today. I mean, that's what a hypocrite is. I mean, everywhere we go, there's masking people, you know. I probably should have one now preaching, but I don't know how I could do that. But to wear a mask is to be a hypocrite. Is that a commentary? Well, I won't go too much further with that. I will ask Jesus, I always ask Jesus to help us. Look at um, Matthew 21. Matthew 21, there was an illustration that the Lord used about hypocrisy. Being hypocrites, wearing the mask. About a fig tree. In the 21st chapter of Matthew, verse 18. Now in the morning he was returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. Wow. That's some serious hunger, okay, of your Lord. They didn't have any figs on it, so he said, you'll never, ever have figs. This is a parable. This is an illustration we need to grasp. grasp. Uh, As I look behind the pages of the culture that day and understand about trees and and fruit, we talked about fruit-bearing trees this morning. We know that, that, that trees bear leaves for themselves for nutrition, their nourishment, but they bear fruit for others. Fruit in our lives is always for others. Now, I'm told the fig tree, when the fig tree has leaves, it simultaneously has fruit. So if you see a fig tree with leaves, it will have fruit unless there's something wrong with the fig tree. So the fig tree had leaves. It was advertising that it had fruit. But upon closer examination by our Lord, he looked and saw no fruit. So the fig tree was being a hypocrite. He was claiming to be one thing and not being another. He was claiming to have fruit by showing of leaves, but in essence he had no fruit. See, many people go into a Christian church who are not Christians. So Paul is 
purposely want to get under our skins in these sections of Scripture this, this, this weeks that we may understand that we are worse off than we thought. In the second chapter, in verses 1 through 5, as I read again this, this evening, there are two things that we bring briefly about God. First of all, we see God is kind. And we see that God is just. Now, some people tell me, I hope God is, is, uh, is really kind and not so much just. I hope he, he is 100% kind and maybe 40% just. But this is not God. God reveals himself in the scripture that God is 100% kind and 100% just. He is both. He is 100% just. Meaning that no one has an excuse before a holy God. Romans 1, Gentiles, no excuse. Romans 2, those in the church or those who are Jewish people, no excuse. He is 100% just. And when his judgment comes, it will be a just judgment. Remember the list in chapter 1. The greed, the envy, the gossip, the unloving, the unmerciful, the disobedient to parents, etc., etc. You see, it, it, it affects every single person in humanity, you and me alike. His kindness will happen, but his justice will come. And it will be just. None of us deserves the kindness of God. But praise God. We praise him. He is 100% kind as well he is merciful he he is forbearing that's what verse four is all about the riches of his goodness and not just a little bit he is forbearance he he's forbearing with us he is patient with me as he is with you he is long-suffering and this patience and long suffering may last in years and years and, and decades in your life and that is, he is doing to draw us to himself. The good news is we are alive today. I'm breathing. You're breathing. We have houses over our houses, roofs of our heads and houses to live in. We have the opportunity to proclaim and to hear the gospel, the good news. And we have the purpose in this difficult day to share this good news, to share this good word of the scriptures and we have the blessing of reading and praying and hearing from God every single day in this blessed book known as his word and when his kindness comes to us and when we repent you know what he does he gives us a heart a mind that hates sin and hypocrisy and hates and injustice and unrighteousness and loves righteousness and loves his word. And that's what he's done in many of us. And we rejoice in what God has done. So I'll leave you with this statement one more time tonight before you head off to bed. You are worse than you realized. <laughs> but the good news is you are more loved than you ever can imagine. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for this day. Both services today, Father, you have certainly, truly blessed us for some hard, heavy teaching from your word. We thank you, Lord, for showing us clearly, Father, that the gospel means that we're worse than we could ever realize. But it also tells us, Lord, that we are loved more than we ever dream and imagine. We thank you for this good news of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us now. We rest tonight. Protect those who travel in the morning. Give them safety. Bless those who are in the hospitals. Bless those who are suffering. Help them, Father. May the word of Christ be a comfort as we share every opportunity you bring. In Jesus' name we pray. And together we say, Amen. Thank you for joining me tonight. God bless you. God willing, we'll be together here in the sanctuary on Wednesday night at 7. God bless you and be careful out there. Good night.